My name is Bob Feldman and I'm Chair of the Learning Science Research Council at McGraw-Hill. I'm here today to welcome you to the first of a series of interviews with distinguished learning scientists from around the world. Our first guest is Ryan Baker, who is from the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Ryan Baker. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Director at the Penn Center for Learning Analytics. Ryan, thank you so much for coming. Great to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really curious about the work that you do. You um, are interested in data mining and analytics. Could you tell us what that is? Historically, we live in a world of small data. Data was expensive and hard to get at, and so the uh, field of statistics developed, trying to be able to make valid inferences from small amounts of data. Uh, nowadays, we live in a different world. We live in a world of big data, even huge data, where we can get so much data from online interaction and other things. So we're no longer worried about trying to figure out what is valid in small data, but instead trying to figure out what can we discover at scale. So what can we, for example, conclude that's not just true of one uh, group of students, and we assume they're like all other students, but actually say, does our finding generalize to this group of students or that group of students? Or for example, does our finding generalize across uh, classroom context and uh, homework context? And we can uh, use data to kind of not just answer uh, inferential questions, but discover patterns that we weren't even thinking about in the first place. And how does this kind of work fit into the larger discipline of learning science? So data mining analytics fit very nicely into modern learning science because historically, if you wanted to conduct learning science or education research, you, know, you had to go out to classrooms, you had to get data from them. Uh, maybe you went to one classroom, maybe you went to six if you had a lot of resources at hand. And if you wanted to study in-depth learning processes, well, you had to do that in the lab, or you had to go out to classrooms with video or interview people. And those methods were very expensive and so they couldn't scale easily. Nowadays, online learning platforms, like for example, McGraw-Hill's Alex, uh, collect data from tens or hundreds of thousands of students, and every single thing they do in the software, every you know answer they enter, every time they look at a worked example, whether they pause or not when the system tells them why they're wrong, we're logging all of that so we can have this gigantic amount of data on students to get both in-depth and at scale. And that combination of in-depth and at scale is a really powerful tool for being able to conduct types of educational research that just weren't possible 20 years ago. Now, you run the Penn Center for Learning Analytics. I'm curious about the specific kinds of things that you do there. So the Penn Center for Learning Analytics has a couple missions. Uh, the first of them is a basic research mission where we take uh, large-scale data from a variety of sources, whether it be online learning data or classroom field observation data or school information system data, and we mine that data to make discoveries about students' engagement and learning and how that relates to their long-term outcomes. Our second mission is one local to the University of Pennsylvania where we support the University of Pennsylvania's online course efforts through creating information for course developers and instructors to help them increase the quality of the courses they're developing. How does this fit in with the larger question of impacts on student success? Do you have research that shows that in fact the work you're doing improves student learning? So everything we're doing we try to tie back into student success. So when we make our models of engagement and learning, we don't just look at that in the short term, we actually connect that to, you know, is the student going to do well on the standardized exam? And in some cases, longer term outcomes. For example, we've studied which learner behaviors in massive online open courses connect to do students actually take that experience and use it in the field? Do students submit scientific papers in the subject they took the online course in? Or for example, in K-12, we look at how online learning behavior in middle school mathematics correlates not just the standardized exam score, but do they go to college? Do they major in STEM in college? And most recently, what career do they take after college? So we've been able to link over more than a decade now our things we're looking at and long-term student outcomes. And then we use that information to feed it back to various developers and try to help them increase the quality of what they're working on. Wow, that's fantastic. So I know that you recently worked on a paper with McGraw-Hill Learning Scientists. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? So in fact, I've had the great opportunity to work with MHE's Learning Scientists on a variety of projects, but I, one that I'm particularly proud of is the work that uh, Shirin Mojarad and I did at looking at the efficacy of the ALEC system. So there's been a lot of questions about how should we measure efficacy appropriately in education research, with some people saying you should only use a randomized control trial where you randomly assign students to condition A or condition B before the start of the year. 
But in fact, that's hard to do in real world education. And a lot of researchers instead look at quasi-experiments, where some instructors choose to use a system and others don't. In real world educational settings, it's often very hard to do randomized assignment of students to courses or of conditions to instructors. So in this study, we looked at data from a technical college in the Midwest where the instructors had chosen to use the system or not, and then even within that, some students chose to use the system or not. And we wanted to be able to draw valid inference. One thing that people do a lot within quasi-experimental research is they say, I want to find one way of trying to construct a fair comparison between the experimental students and the control students. But when you do that, you always open yourself up to challenge. Because let's say that there's 700 ways to do that analysis. Well, you pick the one that looks good for you, and uh, people will do that. So instead, uh, Sharon and I picked, I believe it was eight different ways to slice the data. Eight completely different ways of comparing students, and found that in all eight, it had the same story. Alex was more effective than the traditional approaches. So by doing that, and I think that's a new paradigm for quasi-experimental studies that you can do with big data, don't just try to find one way of doing it that you think is best that's open to challenge. Look at it so many different ways that the results are not open to challenge anymore. Hmm. Um, as one of the rising stars in the field of learning science, I'm curious about who your own heroes are. Um, is there anyone who stands out in your eyes as to having a, a very large impact on the work that you do? You know, Isaac Newton said, I can only see so far because I've stood on the shoulders of giants, and I really feel like that's true in my case. Uh, there are so many people who have inspired my work. One of them is Herb Simon, who I had the luck of having him speak in my class, but I never met him personally before he passed away. And Herb had so many ideas that I thought were really revolutionary and still are revolutionary. His discussion in The Sciences of the Artificial of the key role that context plays in explaining the phenomena we see directly shaped my decision to get involved in context research and even found the journal Computer-Based Learning in Context. His motto of anything worth doing is worth doing badly has inspired a lot of my work because what that really means is, I think, a lot of times there's not a perfect method for doing something. So find a way to answer that research question, bring it out there to the world, and then open it to challenge. For other people to challenge, for yourself to challenge. And that openness to challenge and getting stuff out there is key to advancing science. I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention all the people who've been mentors in my own career, like Art Gracer, Janice Gobert, Ken Katinger, Al Corbett. They've played uh, such an important role in helping shape me as a scholar. I feel like the key to being a successful scholar in any field is being able to learn from as many wonderful people as you can. What are you reading right now, um, or recently? I'm, I'm interested in any, anything you've been reading that's really blown you away. You know, one of the things that really inspires me, actually, in my work is 1950s science fiction. Um, 1960s science fiction. I'm a real fan of the can-do attitude that, of that era. But one of the things that I've been reading that's kind of a little bit of a funny thing to be reading, but maybe interesting, is I've recently been reading some of the catalogs that the Amish and other uh, kind of less electrically connected folks read and use to purchase products. Because I've been finding it fascinating to look at the alternate approaches that they use to solve problems that are often solved in uh, you know, through high expensive uh, technologies, um, electricity. And uh, one of the things I find really fascinating about that kind of technology is looking at alternate approaches. I find that looking at alternate approaches and thinking about alternate approaches inspires me to look for alternate approaches in my own work. That's really interesting. Um, I never would have expected that. <laughs> um, it's been great talking with you. I really appreciate the time you've offered us. Um, and we'll talk more later. Thank you, Bob. Always a pleasure.